Welcome everyone to the fourth and final presentation of the Arctic IT Microsoft Government webinar series. Today, our panel of experts are going to introduce you to Azure Government, the trusted cloud for even the most sensitive government agencies. In this presentation, we'll show you how Azure Government provides the flexibility, exclusivity, and above all, the security and compliance required to run your agency more efficiently. Our presenters today are Dave Bailey of Arctic IT and David Zarlene of Microsoft. Dave Bailey serves as Arctic IT's president and general manager. He has been leading our organization in the government sector since our inception in 2003. Also joining us today is David Zarling from Microsoft. David is an Azure Solutions Specialist specifically for Microsoft state and local government team. He will be conducting a demonstration of Azure in action at the end of the presentation. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Dave Bailey. Well, thank you very much, Joanne, and welcome, David. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, and uh, so here's a little agenda for us for our hour today together. Uh, what is Azure Government? Hopefully, most of the folks on the phone have uh, heard of what Microsoft Azure is, um, cloud environment that Microsoft um, has a couple different flavors of. There's a public sector cloud or the government cloud. Um, there's the commercial cloud. There's even a piece of the cloud that's called government high uh, for things like DOD, top level security clearance type stuff. So uh, the cloud in and of itself, we'll talk about a few different flavors of that. Um, and then talk about what types of workloads do we see getting migrated to Azure? Um, Azure is a very big term. The cloud itself is even a bigger term. So we're gonna try to narrow that down to some uh, chewable components, if you will, uh, so that you can leave today's hour with uh, maybe some action items or some better ideas on different workloads you might consider moving uh, into that space. Um, David's going to take us on a little bit of a field trip into, to, into a, a live uh, console of Azure, and then we'll talk about some steps maybe to get started um, into that journey and have some time for Q&A. Right, so I like to start any kind of Azure presentation um, specifically where it's not just a destination, right? Azure government is a capability. Many people look at the cloud as just simply another place to take what they have down here on the ground and put it somewhere else in someone else's cloud. But that's not an accurate depiction of what you actually gain. So we're gonna talk about some of the key attributes that make cloud and, and specifically Azure a capability, not just a place to go with your assets. So one of the key aspects here we're talking about too is Azure for government. Now you heard me say earlier that there's Azure commercial and there's Azure government. Azure government is a specific uh, section, if you will, of the cloud that actually has geographic and physical differences um, in, the, in the data center in and of itself. Um, industry leading security, and that's a pretty easy thing to say, but truly Microsoft Azure government leads the industry on secure infrastructure and capability. More compliance certifications than any other cloud provider out there, including our friends at AWS. And it meets many of the compliance issues that constantly evolve uh, throughout government utilization, especially when it comes to things like GDPR, um, public information and how, how the public interacts with cloud technologies, Microsoft leads the way um, in that government space as well as the commercial space. So let's talk a little bit about the differences in that and what the government differences would be. So when we look at regions, um, there's probably 13 or 14 different data centers that Microsoft can say physically are within the continental United States. Um, four of them are what we call Gov regions. Two of them are what we call DOD regions. You heard me talk about Azure Government and then Azure Government Pi. Those DOD regions, those data centers, uh, notice that those points are pretty wide, not specifically identified on the map. Right? There's a there's a, a different set of security standards that apply there. Um, but want to make sure you know that physically these places exist inside the contiguous U.S. Um, and they have different um, regulations as far as who can work in those centers, uh, U.S. citizenship, 
uh, security clearances that have to be had. Um, not just anybody's walking through, sleeping through the data center. It's very, very tight security, as you might imagine. So there's physical control, there's logical control, network control that all exceeds typical data center um, security that you'd expect. So it's uh, definitely a different space, right? You'll also notice something called express route. So connecting to anybody's cloud environment is going to require a good internet connection. Microsoft has available what they call express route connectivity, depending on the geographic or metropolitan area that you're in, you can have uh, dedicated uh, circuits between your business location and Microsoft's cloud. So that shrinks down competition for uh, bandwidth and gives you additional layers of security into that data center over and above traditional internet access through an ISP. Yeah, Dave, well said. Uh, I was just going to add that uh, those express routes are a private direct connection, so you can avoid going over the the, the internet if needed. You can use your secure uh, virtual private network in addition, but the express route are, are dedicated uh, private lines, and those on ramps uh, that you saw are a way to get onto our fiber backbone. And once you're there, once you're in those on ramps, then you have the the, the high speed secure. Uh, access to, uh, to to our government data centers. Yeah, it's it's a big it's a big difference uh, competitively and also performance wise. But I think that the overarching business justification that we see is additional layers of security uh, that you can put in there. Virtual network and, and secure infrastructure um, have a different uh, different topology when you get into that that express route. So very uh, very good differentiation. Uh, FedRAMP high. Uh, Promise I'm not going to go through all the items on this slide, um, but when we talk about the types of services, Azure again, big term for cloud capability and a myriad of services that are available from Microsoft. Um, what are we familiar with? One that I've been working a lot on personally uh, from an education and practice perspective is Azure cognitive services, machine learning, different things like that, robotic process automation. Um, one, because we're fascinated with it, and two, it's creeping into the business application space, and people just don't have that kind of infrastructure and compute capability on premise. So the cloud is the only first and best way to take advantage of that. So we're spending a lot of time there. But you can see one of the top ones over here on the left is Azure Active Directory. Anybody in the IT space or business application space or just even a standard end user, Active Directory is a big part of your life. And it has evolved into a much more robust identity management infrastructure and authentication type uh, platform that um, continues to evolve through that Azure infrastructure. Uh, as security threats increase and different ways of accessing applications, single sign-on capability, multi-factor, and even just identity in and of itself, as we look at a multi-device named user world, um, that's just the starting gate to get into Azure, but there's a myriad of different things. Now, Azure's marketplace is bigger than what you see here. This is just a listing of what we call Azure government services that are authorized with a FedRAMP high designation. So that's the highest level of FedRAMP you can get. Um, and uh, from an industry competition perspective or capability, uh, Microsoft leads the way here by far. Dave, I thought I'd add, um, it, it isn't uncommon for governments that are well down the road agencies to use both commercial and gov. Uh, FedRAMP high is what unites them. And then what distinguishes in particular Azure government is when you have either CGIS, criminal justice information, uh, or IRS 1075, above and beyond your FedRAMP. Um, so those are particularly targeted uh, workloads for uh, Azure Gov. Yeah, it's interesting that the parity that's evolved between the commercial and the government cloud as security standards for both have kind of started to come together. Um, you know, we have you know, quite a few, uh, which we'll highlight later, quite a few um, public sector deployments. And uh, without exception, every one of them has both commercial Azure resources and government Azure resources. Right. There's some consolidation as more functionality moves from the commercial side into the government side of the business application space. 
we see some of that commercial uh, commitment shrinking. Um, but when you get into public facing type tech, especially the transactional side of a government agency interacting with the public, the commercial cloud for some different use cases is a better place to take advantage of that because of the security boundaries that are built into those two different cloud worlds. Uh, so it's a very interesting dynamic and it definitely shifts back and forth. So that's definitely good for pointing that out. Um, so open cloud uh, for state and local government. So when we talk about um, security and compliance requirements, state and local government, they continue to evolve. Um, but on-premise infrastructure and cloud infrastructure differ in an organization's ability to scale that security. And that's probably the biggest thing that I like to hit on. I'm, I'm a little bit of a security guy myself outside of the business application space. And just the sheer capability that Azure and that security at scale gives any organization um, is one of the key investment components that, that I always like to make sure customers are aware of and understand. Um, so you heard David mention uh, Sieges. Well, when you look at the kind of information that's going back and forth, even sharing government to government data um, and different types of entities that have to do business with state, local, federal government, um, having a secure network and a secure cloud platform to do that, Microsoft leads the way. One, uh, if you wouldn't mind, just a quick uh, jump on that. The the Sieges part of it, it by state. So we we meet those standards for, for criminal justice information as part of the service but then we have to go state by state and meet state relevant laws applied to CJIS. so that's what this represents is the, the the additional step of going local and making sure that we're compliant with local CJIS related laws so just an example i think of going the extra you know length to make sure that you are compliant and you are secure, and that when you have an audit and the auditor has arrived, we're going to take a huge responsibility in making sure you can, you know, offload that that pain to us, and that you're going to pass that, not just with a broad s s stroke, but actually apply it to individual states. Yeah, that's a great point, David. And there's a link. There's a link here in the deck if anybody wants it after our presentation. It's important to know. Um, that you know, when you look at what we refer to at a security level called inherited controls, any kind of compliance audit that you're going through, it's a huge advantage to have a partner and with a cloud community as well that you can inherit the controls from their cloud security posture. And that's really what David's alluding to here is that not only are they taking on federal standards and international standards, but Microsoft's taking that down actually to the state level to adopt different locality and state regulations into some of those standards that you can inherit controls from as well. Um, some states are easier than others, as you might imagine. Um, some are more difficult. <laughs> so, uh, it is a big that's investment, right. and that's definitely something that you, that's an example of scale too. How do you pay for that kind of compliance in your own efforts to secure your infrastructure versus what Microsoft can invest in that effort? There's really no comparison. That's right. Right. So here um, we have a uh, couple different ideas. Now, we, David and I spent some time with our marketing team and our application team just to talk about some of the, what we'll call the, uh, the greatest hits right now that we see from a market relevance perspective. You saw that big list earlier on the slide. Yeah, we can't go into enough detail on a fraction of that. But here are some really key areas. So we talk about uh, mission critical applications, custom web experiences, and then really the data platform and how is data becoming more available uh, or valuable, I should say, when we move to a cloud infrastructure. So some of those key areas, for example, virtual machines, uh, dev and test labs for production technology. How do you spin those up and scale those as frequently as you need to without having the additional cost of infrastructure? And then just simply Azure SQL database. One of the key aspects and key values of Azure that we use in every single project we do in the public sector, whether it's state, local, or federal, is we will use Azure SQL resources to migrate data, test data, um, different capacities, just at a minimum. And then nine times out of 10, we're going to end up consolidating, whether it's an Azure data lake or something like that over on the inside, insights component. 
Uh, we're going to leverage Azure SQL in every project that we do. You cannot do it any more cost effectively in the cloud. Turn on the resources when you need them, expand the capacity as the data job gets bigger and bigger, shrink it back down once you go live. The value is, is immeasurable there, of being able to stop and start those resources and then not have that physical capital investment sitting on the ground when you're done using it. So custom web experience is another key aspect as, uh, as well. Um, developing web applications and having the infrastructure to support that, whether it's a mobile app, tablet-based app, um, maybe sometimes it's a power app that we might do from a model-driven perspective, but we need additional SQL resources to backfill that data as customers use it to make it more uh, efficient and fast. Uh, the possibilities are in it. So this is just what we would consider some greatest hits. Hey, Dave. I. Uh... I had a couple of examples uh, that I might like to share here. Uh, sure. Mission critical, I think it's a real trend, right? As we get into this COVID, post-COVID world, what, what we've discovered and what I think agencies and governments have discovered is digital organizations are resilient organizations. And uh, this, this COVID period is accelerating patterns, particularly around mission critical. So we have, I'll just give you an example of a, of an unusual, a, 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 a state-led health exchange, right? That runs on Oracle, Red Hat Oracle Linux. And uh, we, we migrated that to Azure government. And um, if for the purposes of, you, you know, being resilient, disaster recovery, et cetera. And uh, that agency is, is uh, Cost reduction of about 650 million, sorry, 650,000 a year, 650,000 a year. So real non-Microsoft mission critical apps moving regularly to Azure government. And uh, and then all the patterns and learnings that come from that is, you know, working with, with great companies like yours is what we want to share. Yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting dynamic. Um, you know, one of the things that we've seen a big uptick in inquiries, not so much deployment quite yet, but people are starting to ask um, is edge computing. And edge is a really interesting term for people. Um, if you don't have a lot of depth in it, edge sounds like, well, aren't we just bringing it back from the cloud and putting it on premise? It's like, well, no, uh, that's not really what it means. Uh, but edge computing is specifically in healthcare hospitals that have to expand volume for some type of crisis or response or, you know, hurricane stricken, you know, city or infrastructure, something like that, that just can't function with their current infrastructure, whether it's temporary or burst bandwidth, and they need compute storage power right there locally for a period of time, edge computing and the ability to eliminate bottlenecks with cloud or, you know, speed of deployment, capital, all different types of things, edge computing has become a big component of this as well. Um, picture being able to take, actually without any exception, every single thing that you see on this slide and putting it into a device that is this big, right? This big, this is a little smart client, <laughs> putting it down there on the, on the edge and having that run in a tactical situation, um, a, a, you know, a disaster situation, or even a traditional commercial business situation where I have manufacturing at capacity for the holidays or something to that effect, and I need that local compute, I can't depend on an internet connection, I'm going to use Edge. So that's another, another great example of how that's kind of changed uh, for us recently. So why migrate to Azure? When I think about, um, you know, the global capability of Azure, it's like, okay, um, where is the cloud, right? Every once in a while, I have to tell my father and remind him that the cloud is on the ground. He looks up when he talks about it, right? And sometimes when we're talking about it as cloud professionals, we'll even use a hand up in the air and reference cloud. Right? It's up there. Um, but globally, Microsoft Azure is extremely big network of Azure data centers, compute power and storage all throughout the world. So even when we get into state, local, federal, and even commercial applications, that, that range is going to span the globe. Um, there are many instances where we're using what we would call a multi-cloud strategy. And multi-cloud is kind of a, an interesting term. David and I had some dialogue about this the other day. 
most industry experts when they talk about multi-cloud are gonna talk about um, brands of cloud, um, AWS, Microsoft, Google, um, something to that effect. When folks that focus on that Microsoft space, when we talk about multi-cloud, we talk about Azure, Dynamics 365, and Microsoft 365. Almost every one of our projects at Arctic IT and our, and our client base, when a customer wants to do an application modernization and they're looking at the security of how they're gonna do that, they're looking at the compliance of what they need and then the regions, we're doing a project within the army right now. Um, we're looking at restrictions in Korea and we're looking at restrictions in Germany and everything in between to make sure everybody can use the same system across multiple DOD agencies, you name it. Well, having that global scale, even if your local use is what's talked about, that understanding, capability, capacity, and expertise is huge. And a security operations center that is focused on a global threat, not just a local threat like a typical infrastructure might be, that's a very, very big value. And that's another example of security at scale. So we talked about extensive network, security, compliance. Um, let's go into some more detail. I'll turn it over to you. Great, Joel, just a quick comment on the, on the last security slide. I think uh, it's the first question everyone asks, is the cloud, in, is the cloud secure? And you saw that global uh, network. And sometimes folks say to us, what does that have to do with me if I'm just local? And the answer is we are, we are having to build out for the security uh, high bars throughout the world. And in effect, bringing that, that learning to Azure government and building that in, and then allowing you to, to in your federal case, you know, integrate uh, with other national players, et cetera. But also that, that global network we have of devices, of Active Directory, basically our, 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 our signals across the globe are what us help you by letting you know what kind of patterns and risks we see and what kind of attack vectors of which we know government and healthcare are primary attack vectors. And then we build in to our software, into our cloud services, abilities for you to, to respond and uh, so you'll see that as we go into Security Center and some other things. Uh, this is example is of that, David, and then I forgot to mention this too, you know, conditional access, for example, right? That's one of the hugest things. What, why is global important from a security framework, network, and capability? Well, conditional access in and of itself, as you get into Azure Active Directory and some of, some of the configurable options in there is, well, if I just had somebody log into a business application through Azure AD and authenticate, let's say in Seattle, Washington, and then five minutes later, I get another authorization request somewhere over in Europe or Asia, conditional access rules would say, you can't be in two places at one time. I have tried actually, can't do it. Um, so it's gonna block that and it's gonna raise a flag and it's gonna send off an alert. That kind of security infrastructure that's global at scale to prevent that kind of um, threat is a huge advantage of the cloud. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it would have been bolder dash to say a couple of years ago that unless you're using cloud services, you're probably not as secure as you can be. And that's really what we are saying is that you are with traditional data centers not able to be as agile, and we're bringing that hybrid capability and allowing you to react in a faster uh, you leverage the signals we see and react. And, and that really does say cloud service is going to help you make be more secure if you work with a great partner and follow our guidance. And, and uh, so thanks. Um, this is really a story about Microsoft's open source platform, right? That as I described that mission critical workload for the health exchange, moving Oracle into Oracle on Azure, you know, that's the basic idea here is that it doesn't matter what you're working with, what language, what program, what what framework. Uh, Microsoft has fully, fully embraced the open source uh, movement. We've made a very large investment in GitHub, as you know, as part to, to sort of represent that, the largest software development environment in the world. And um, I just think sometimes folks can forget that uh, really you could you could deploy in anything on Azure. And this isn't about Microsoft's ecosystem. 
Yeah, that multi that multi vendor that multi platform support uh, is definitely cutting edge. I think a lot of folks assume Microsoft Business Applications in and of themselves too, um, outside of the Azure platform, um, are very, um, if you would say, you know, focused just on that Microsoft stack. But that's not the case. I mean, you look at you look at the new device that they're coming out with, where it's a basically a Microsoft Surface operating system, right? And uh, it's got an Android phone built into it. That, that, yeah. That's a that's a collab nobody saw coming. Pretty cool. Right. <laughs> right. So uh, I, I, you kind of alluded to it, but this idea that there is much, so much more to our data center, global data center environment that you probably couldn't build yourself. And there is, that means there are a set of services, AI, artificial intelligence driven services, cognitive services, machine learning services that you can build in and integrate with your environment and leverage at a much more rapid pace. And in doing so, we're helping governments, it's an overused word, but transform and become digitized, if you will, become resilient and be able to innovate. And this is a really, really important term. It's not just another data center. It's capabilities that you pointed out and things that, that aren't, wouldn't be possible otherwise. So uh, uh, examples of transform, right? We're in the middle of COVID. We're working with agencies that have a responsibility from an analytics and data platform to, to tell uh, the public, you know, how is testing going, which in turn is driving the stages of emerging from COVID and effectively guiding us as, uh, you know, in this, uh, when we go back to work. And those systems, uh, many of them we've worked with agencies to move them to Azure for the purpose of speed, purpose of leveraging AI to recognize patterns and to bring the kind of reliability that some of those legacy systems uh, are challenged with, and yet are literally making to help make decisions for our lives. So those are those are transformational things. Um, we're doing things with cognitive services, uh, basically simple chatbots that are using artificial intelligence to understand spoken word, language, uh, uh, what you're typing into. Uh, you know, to search uh, and I'll basically offloading all those questions that are coming to help desks or agencies that are sending people back to uh, reemploy. These chatbots can uh, are playing a huge role in learning. The more questions they're asked, the more accurate they become. Uh, so that's an example of AI being infused and something that everyone on this, you know, listening has access to and can build very, very rapidly. And you said you're excited about that, so it's great to hear. Yeah, all you gotta do is feed the machine and it talks back to you. <laughs> right. Uh, so as part of that, you know, this idea of data is really one of the most important assets you have as an agency and all of us to guide us in data-driven decision-making. We have a very established pattern called a data warehouse or data estate that allows to really solve the problem that's been a, a thorny problem for, I'm sure you will, you're, you've all experienced is how do I integrate data from multiple sources? How do I do that securely so that there's privacy and data is obfuscated where it's need? How do I transform that data and make it useful to different systems? How do I uh, take that data and make it the, the, a way that I can train systems to answer questions, uh, et cetera. So this pattern of a, of a data estate, data lake, uh, leveraging data factory, data storage is, is really quite revolutionary in our world and helping us uh, customers do things that they've never done before. And it's, it's distinct from, you know, lifting and shifting just infra, you know, uh, infrastructure as a service or servers. Uh, it's really a, a data, cent, data centric play and um, at the heart of, of what we consider transformation in government and then visualizing that. So uh, agencies like in healthcare, like in transportation that need to collaborate, for example, working with the transportation agencies now where we're, you know, they were building uh, insight into traffic and when emergencies and how we respond. It's really a, a data centric exercise uh, and an ability to visualize and present that information in real time so that people can make decisions uh, that that impact lives. 
Yeah, so, some of those data, some of those data um, projects are available. What that the, the NHTSA website out there for DOT is one of those um, amazing use of both Power BI visualization and real time churn of, of data information. And just another point too, when you think about that one component there, model and serve. You think just traditional application infrastructure, building out different environments. And when you get into situations where you have to do what if scenarios and strategic planning and things like that, just look at the crisis that we're in right now, not just from a health concern perspective, which I think are really acute understandings for most people of how that would get applied, but look at the business impacts. You talk about phase, you know, lighting back up different pieces as, and stages as people go back to work. It's like, well, what is the economic impact of that? If I open up 25% of the capacity of all my restaurants in a community, what's that going to do to the business? Well, if they have 100% of the expense with 25% of the business inside their doors, it's not going to help much. So is that a strategy? They didn't really consider that data very well in the state of New Jersey, not to poke too much fun, but um, it's, it's a really interesting thing. They don't have the ability to look at the effects of what they do. So these are some examples specifically the Azure Synapse Analytics, where I don't need to build infrastructure and real-time brick and mortar resources. I can use in-memory processing for data resources to chunk, challenge, and build out all different types of scenarios and then flush it or save it, depending on what I want to do with it. And that's using data at scale, especially when you have a big dependency on making decisions quick. Right? So great, great examples. All right, so we talked about the security and compliance of our global ecosystem and data centers, but this is really about knowing that there are tools within Azure itself that can help you monitor and strengthen your security posture of both your on-premise resources and the cloud and do it in a very proactive way that can help you monitor you know, threats, uh, investigate them, and react to them. So. Uh, again, this underlies this notion that we think we can help you be more secure than you otherwise would be. And security center starts off with a free tier then goes to a, a, a purchase tier. And uh, it's, it's just a very, very valuable tool to help you when you know, again, you're being targeted during elections uh, as a government and as a healthcare organization. Um, WannaCry is an example. I had many customers that were targeted by that in years past, and the customers had to answer the question, have certain machines been patched? And in a very rapid sense, because it was a targeting those unpatched machines. And uh, if you couldn't answer that question, you were you were at risk. And uh, this would this is just a tool that can answer that very, very rapidly without much effort that's pre-configured in the cloud and that's native. So yeah, and two two really concrete quick examples, right? So you're looking at the patch you know, volume of, of, of a big infrastructure, even just a small development environment, maybe with 10, 12 virtual machines in there. If you got hit, the amount of effort, cost, money inside of just a development environment, not just production, but just development alone, um, compromised by something like that. If you can't answer the question of what was patched and what state it's in, you have to assume everything's been compromised versus these six are saved out of these four or out of these 10, so I have four that might have been compromised because I can look at the patch level. Little things like that, most of our infrastructures out there in the state and local government side are, are good for that, but do you know how many times we've gone into an AWS environment where they've had a bunch of resources out there? Maybe they're backed up, but the backups are not encrypted, things like that. So what's Azure Security Center gonna tell us? Even for something simple like a few virtual server workloads, you go into the Azure Security Center, the free version of it, if those two workloads aren't backed up on encrypted um, storage or something to that effect, it's gonna tell you you have a vulnerability. It's gonna just flag that out there, it's gonna paint that picture for you, and that's just little simple minimal stuff. And then of course it gets bigger from there. Yeah, one, uh, one other example, I have a, uh, a state and uh, we're working with and they uh, have had, you know, well, they're very concerned about a ransomware attack. So what they've done, and, and based on some of the insights they're getting from Azure Migrate. So as a simple step, they've basically taken a third copy, they have a backup data center, a third copy and put it in Azure under immutable storage so that no matter what happens, 
there is a copy that uh, could be used to, to restore uh, no matter what tools are used. So a simple immutable lock applied to every piece of data. And uh, I think people you know, sleep, sleep, sleep better at that, at, at that, with that solution. Yeah, not many people, you know, prior to cloud capability were able to say that with confidence unless they were holding it in their pocket, <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah. definitely, uh, and, you know, even even the capability of bring your own key where the, the, the encryption key itself isn't even something that anybody has access to except the, the holder of that account. Very, very powerful options. Tell us a little bit about Azure Migrate, David. Yep, so Azure Migrate is another set of tools that we're making uh, available free to great partners like you or directly with customers uh, to, to, to automate the process of going through migrations, to simplify, to make migrations more flexible. I think other than security, people say, well, what about, what is, what do I, what don't I know that I would need to do to, 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 to do a migration? And so this is a, a tool uh, that'll help you discover your environment, assess it, and then if you want, uh, do do the migration itself with uh, a, a par partners. And uh, it, it's just an example of the sort of tooling improvements we're making in Azure, the automation, the discovery, and uh, that the services is always improving. And so this is a, a, a really great native built-in set of services that are gonna make you feel better about your path to the cloud and what, where you should start and what you need to do to remediate pieces of your environment before they move to the cloud, et cetera. Yeah, and you know, one, of the, one of the ones that we use quite a bit for clients is um, Azure Site Recovery. Not the same thing, a little bit different, but people that have aversion and fear, uncertainty, doubt, FUD, of moving a workload to the cloud because I'm not sure it's gonna perform well. We say, well, let's just start with backup. Like, what do you mean? Well, let's let's just use Azure Site Recovery, for example. Take these three virtual machines, set them up in an Azure subscription a trial, even if you want, and it'll migrate over time, no impact to the end users, right? It gets up there, and let's actually cut over to it as if we had a situation where on-premise couldn't have access and cut over to that Azure resource in near real time. Nine times out of 10, the customer is like, uh, no difference, this is great. Can we just keep using that? Absolutely. Let's light up the subscription, keep it there, deprecate that on-premise resource, set up the backup and security around it, and you migrate it to the cloud. So there's different ways to get up there. This is an example of some of the great tools that Microsoft puts out there. So let's talk about workloads. Um, it's, it's interesting to say, hey, you know, what can I move up there? Um, and you don't have to do all that groundwork assessment and, and, and research yourself. There is, because of the great, we'll call it the great migration <laughs> and shift uh, to the cloud, there are, there are quite a few um, uh, tools and um, sections inside that Azure marketplace. Azure Advisor is a, is a great service, um, part and parcel of, of Azure Migrate, of course, uh, that'll tell you um, the different considerations you need to have based upon the workloads you've defined. For example, if you have several line of business applications that are critical in your opinion that you have to keep on premise to serve the public, um, and most of our government resource, government clients have those, right? Um, okay, well, what is the data that you're using out of those? And does the data need to stay down there or can we make it more valuable, more secure and more efficiently used by other things by shifting it up? Well, let's take a look at how much data do we have. Let's look at the integration structure. How is it being consumed? How are people visualizing it? How many times do you have a conversation about a bunch of data you get around, David, and all of a sudden people are like, we don't even look at it. <laughs> right? So what are yeah. you doing with it? Well, it still has risk and it still might be valuable to somebody, but you've built this whole consumption strategy around a bunch of data that nobody uses. So even evaluating and classifying the types of data and why it's valuable is part of this exercise. So the Azure Architecture Center as well um, as partners, we provide that consultancy, but in our government customers, they also have access to things like fast track engineers and different architects inside Microsoft, where we even as a partner might have such a large workload, we'll work directly as a partner on the customer's behalf with Microsoft's team to say, hey, this is a, this is a lot of data, and these are the use cases, 
let's come up with an Azure architecture that supports the following key reasons why we're moving up there and what we need to get out of it. Right, so you don't have to take that on depending on the size of your organization and the and the uh, you know the maturity of your your cloud knowledge inside those options um, between a partner and Microsoft. There's plenty of resources out there, and Azure Logic Apps is a huge um, huge value. When that came out a few years back, being able to take a look at those workloads, where I've found it most recently valuable, and this was new to me is in determining what kind of robotic process automation you want to use based upon the logic required to access Azure resources. There's lots of data migration tasks, sync ups, in a, you know, all that stuff, jobs, data jobs, that Azure Logic Apps can vastly improve. Here's an example. Have a mobile application that we use on devices out in the field, um, whether it's for tax assessment, uh, watershed management, which we'll talk a little bit about. And I want to capture all that data on a mobile interface. I'm going to store that inside an Azure SQL data store with a web application, but then I need to load that into a Dynamics application to be consumed and used in property valuation, permit assessment, whatever the case might be. I'm going to use an Azure Logic app to determine what the cycle of that information is, how it needs to be available on the device, and how it needs to be available in the model-driven app on the dynamic side. So there you have a, an Azure Logic app that's going to shape um, how I'm going to consume the data both on a mobile device and in a back office situation, and also make sure that the timing of how that data is revealed to those end users is managed and secure. So just, just a great amount of capability there. But we don't have to write that code. We use a Logic app to establish that for us. This is, you know, you have to look at um, cost savings and talk about ROI. We had some interesting dialogue about return on investment. You know, one of the things I always find interesting, you know, we've been, I've been with the organization Arctic IT for about 18 years now, working in the business application space. And 20 plus years ago, we'd be talking about the return on investment for putting in a new business application or moving to a new technology. And we thought we could calculate it and it was always somewhat subjective and the reality was is after you started the project and the customer started using the tech nobody ever asked nobody said hey what's my return on investment the key difference between looking at roi and cost savings today is the fact that we have the data this is not stuff that's made up so when we look at saying i want to move to the cloud to save money to move from a capital expenditure to an operating expense, and then actually use the ability to shrink down consumption based upon my use cases and my utilization of compute and storage. There is no arguing that the cloud is not only more secure, which David pointed out. We used to, you know, people used to say, hey, is the cloud more secure? Now it's, you know, we know that it's more secure and it's, you know, is your on-premise environment less secure than the cloud? That's the conversation completely turned around. But now we look at cost savings. We know the cloud has the ability to save us money in a multitude of areas. Compute, storage, and security are the three big ones that I like to talk about. But IT staff productivity, that's probably my favorite one there. It is increasingly more difficult to get talent, even as a partner, as an organization, that has the depth of knowledge to put into that, that technology space, very challenging. Being able to take staff that you've already onboarded, that know your environment, that are part of that process and make them more productive because they're not turning screws and working on manual processes to use infrastructure, that's a huge value. So there's some, there's some details in here too about where this data came from, and I strongly encourage that, that folks look yeah, and, and, and we are eager to help you develop a business case and prove, prove a total cost of ownership or develop a ROI and lots of resources to help you do that. And that's, and this is a good example, right? Yeah. Azure migration program. So this represents a program where we've been, it created a, a, a set of best practices where partners like you, great partners that, call, that, that can then leverage uh, patterns, uh, tools that are at no cost and then best practices and then Microsoft included in this is, is investments to help you, depending on your type of workload, uh, 
uh, migrate and and modernize and optimize. So this is about accelerating the path. Yep. Yep, the AMP program is great. And if you want more information on that, we can definitely share that with you. It's a big advantage, um, no risk to get involved in it. And it definitely gives you a roadmap. And from an IT perspective, if you have to go to your senior leadership and justify expense, great exercise. And we used to we used to dread having to do ROI exercises. Now it's like, no, let us let us actually show you we have a bunch of new technology that can jump into that environment and measure that value. So journey to the cloud, um, combination of migrate and innovate. It's one thing to get your workloads up there. Now, how are you gonna take advantage of what you've done? Remember, it's a capability, not just a destination. So migrate really references the destination. Um, innovation is really what highlights, you know, how are we going to make that a better capability? And so just an interesting graphic to, to drive that point a little bit more home. I have a quick uh, example of Innovate. So working with the fire department, they had a problem with the radio. Radio is calling into emergencies and uh, over in the background is a chainsaw. Uh, what is said in the code, the type of words they're using determines actions and urgency and basically is, impacts lives. And uh, often the radio is very poor and the, the, uh, the central communication center can't make out what is being said. We basically applied machine learning, cognitive services, language services, and now can help with transcription and translation uh, and recordings so that real time and afterwards, uh, we, they can understand better what's being communicated and, and uh, literally save lives. So an example of an advanced service doing something that very innovative uh, that, that impacts us. Yeah, we're starting to see some of that in wildfire capability too. It goes back to edge computing. If I can put technology on the ground in a fluid situation, what kind of better capability do those folks have in that in that in that work, right? So, um, so what's driving migrations to Azure? Um, you know, migration and innovation triggers. We just had, I would say, an innovation trigger in 2020. Probably don't have to paint the picture there. Several innovation triggers in 2020. Um, so capability, remote work, um, the ability to switch back and forth between remote work, on-premise work, and still, uh, you know, serving a client base and a community in need from a public sector perspective has definitely been turned on its head. Some organizations were prepared, some aren't. Um, you know, as a partner and, and as Microsoft, we're pretty excited about what that opportunity is. It's actually one of the things that caused us to create this public sector campaign and talk about the value of Azure so that folks that we reach um, have that, that understanding. Um, so this is just a graphic to kind of highlight that. I want to make sure I give David some time to jump into um, his, his portal um, as well. So one cloud, many solutions. You heard me talk about this earlier. We have Dynamics 365. Microsoft 365 and Azure, uh, those really are three different cloud environments. Um, you can't necessarily have one without the other though. Um, and that's a really interesting thing. So when someone comes to us for a business application, our first question is, what kind of Azure and Microsoft 365 investment do you have? Well, why? Well, user authentication, security, integration, all the other things that make a business application successful um, in the end user's eyes, these three things have to work together. Leadership and IT have to make sure that those platforms, Microsoft brings that unique capability to the table, which is why that's where our focus is to have both that productivity suite and Office 365, the security identity and collaboration capability of Microsoft 365, and then Azure for all the different resources we have and business applications. Think about being able to address all of those clouds in one vendor suite with one identity, one security platform, and one pane of glass to make sure it's all going well. That's a pretty impressive capability, right? So anytime we move something up into the cloud environment, it's important for us to know that there's a path, there's a methodology we're gonna to use to get there develop, secure, deploy, innovate, enhance is typically the mantra. Depending on how much development's involved or configuration of an app, it could follow an agile process. We're 
just talking pure, I have to move it from on-premise to the cloud, it goes a little quicker, but we don't skip any of those steps. We have two examples, um, King County and City of Seattle, um, very forward thinking and how they leverage technology and innovation, impressive organizations to work with. Both of these organizations are using all three of those clouds in several projects. Um, we're doing something for King County with tax assessment where they need their field workers that do property tax assessment they, um, to have mobile technology in their hands. They also need to improve their billing process. They're, they were on a 30 year old legacy technology built on a mainframe. And that entire workload, including the billing, uh, invoicing, uh, data collection, everything moving into the Microsoft government cloud, um, and using all three clouds, Microsoft 365, Azure workloads, very quite a few different ones, as well as two flavors of dynamics, CRM capacity for that public interaction. We're using Xamarin for mobile apps development. And we're also using Dynamics 365 for finance and operations to do the accounting and billing for the tax system. City of Seattle, their watershed and utilities component, they have a large watershed, as you might imagine, and they have to maintain who goes on it, what they're doing on it, whether or not they brought a boat from a, another body of water into that watershed that might have an invasive species on it. So there's environmental concerns, licensing, security, all types of stuff. Water supply to the city of Seattle is very important. Using all three components of the Microsoft Cloud to deliver a solution to not a large organization inside the city of Seattle, but they have a big technology need that's delivered with that multi-cloud capability. So those are just two highlights I wanted to share. Good ones. Then, uh, Joanne, why don't you make David a uh, presenter, please? Okay. Here you go, David. Thank you. All right, are you seeing my screen there, Dave? Yeah, you're good. Good. Hey, so I just wanted to just give you a little orientation to the Azure environment. This is called the Azure portal. And uh, there's just the, the notion of simplicity and ease and the sort of built in contextual guidance that's here. Uh, so, you know, this is designed for IT teams and uh, to work as a team. And there's just some great resources here to think about. And I really want you to take away that this is this is easy to use constantly evolving and improving and uh, can be a real asset to your careers and then we've got a we've got you know investments here to help you successful so as an example you can modify this the, your environment here in any way you want you can look at all of the services or build your own uh, uh, dashboard um, uh, you can you know literally spin up a virtual machine a database uh, a, a logic app just on the fly very quickly. You can see what you've built and the status of those built. Uh, and so it's a, just a very flexible tool uh, uh, to, to begin working with. And the, the to begin, there are some great examples of quick starts right here that are built in that basically represent repeatable uh, steps that others are to take frequently. So we've got, you know, Azure built-in setup guides, migration guides on the bottom. We've got things that you're going to be doing on a regular basis. How do I deploy a virtual machine? And it will walk you through uh, the step-by-step -step process to do that. If you want to set up a, you know, we've talked about the sort of open platforms. You could build out a Linux machine or, or Windows. And again, it's going to take you through uh, steps uh, to go through and 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 build something out like that, um, this kind of fly out interface, and then the breadcrumbs up here to go back uh, is a very typical. You'll you'll pick your uh, subscription. You'll uh, create a resource group or use one you've already built. A resource group is basically a collection of like services that you want uh, to interact and be secure in its own environment. Uh, and then you can go ahead and build out, uh, you know, uh, uh, in this case, a, a virtual machine very quickly. And uh, then you'll pick your data center. In this case, we'll pick, uh, we're in the West here, I am. So the typical pair is Arizona and Texas. 
uh, you can go in and look at uh, whether you want to add redundancy with, uh, with uh, availability sets. I'll skip that for the moment. You can pick uh, the type of server you want to build out. Again, there's the open source, Ubuntu and others, uh, or uh, your flavor of Windows server you'd like. And then also pick the type of sizes that you want to. So, you know, there's uh, a very large set of uh, different types of virtual machines. And then uh, with that comes an understanding of the kind of cost per month uh, should you select that machine. But so lots of uh, flexibility here and then speed uh, to build out in an environment, you know, that would normally take months to do that on premise. Uh, you have also have the ability to, we mentioned Azure Migrate. And so the Azure migration tools are built in. And so it's a, a hub for looking at migration and works in concert with Azure uh, 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 Site Recovery that Dave mentioned. And you can literally go through the process of uh, walking through the steps to uh, discover uh, and then assess your environment uh with a very very simple process for example you can identify whether you've got a hyper-v environment or a vmware environment or physical that you're going to assess um, you can go through and talk about whether you want there's some options here about using an agentless re replication uh, scan or an agent based and, and look at uh, how you'd make that decision so really great built-in tools to be effective uh, you've also got things like Azure Advisor, right? Well, this is a service that's basically going to look at what you've built, look at your resource groups, look at your security environment, and make proactive recommendations of things that you can do to be more secure. Uh, and then, even, probably more importantly, is actually give you uh, the steps to take to remediate those recommendations. I think that's one of the coolest aspects of that tool. You know, when you look at the vast use cases you have and how they're tied together, the fact that it doesn't just tell you, hey, this isn't as secure as it could be, and it gives you the steps and the places where you can go and toggle on, toggle off the different things to improve that security and actually give you a score to rate that by is huge. And it also will tell you if there's a more cost-effective way to run your machines, which is pretty impressive didn't used to do that, right? It would just let you, it would just let you burn the clock, right? You pay, you pay by the drink, right? It would just let you burn the clock. Now it says, hey, this machine is sat idle with no use for the past, you know, you could probably put a tag on it and shut it down for four hours a day uh, because it's not being used, which I thought it was great. So David, I'm gonna uh, have Joanne make me presenter so we can get the last few yeah. slides up here. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Yep, security center is one of those key areas where we spend a lot of time. Um, if you if you spend too much time on it, it's entertaining. Some of our folks in our security practice are obsessed with constantly keeping their security score as high as it can be. And every once in a while, someone will turn on a machine and not have a couple boxes checked and it drops our score. And next thing you know, there's a flurry of emails. Hey man, what are you doing on my score? It's, uh, it's pretty interesting to be able to monitor that level of security. So what does it take to make a digital tra transformation strategy, right? Um, David and I have committed to not using the word digital transformation as long as we could throughout the presentation, but there it happened. I'm sorry, David. So how do we get there? Um, it's, it's about the business case. You don't have to boil the ocean. Pick something small. You know, we find our best experience with our clients is pick a small workload, a business application, whether it's modernization or just, I need to get it out of on-premise and move it to the cloud so it's more secure, something simple. Focus on that, use what you learn, use that experience to build and take advantage of bigger workloads as you move, right? Again, it's not a destination, it is a capability. Security at scale, faster innovation, and the ability to keep up with evolving Clients are, are very big reasons to keep that, that cloud in, in line, right? Um, I don't know if anybody's old enough to know who Rube Goldberg was, but if you've ever watched some of their machines, this is our Rube Goldberg model. We break it into nine steps. We have nine step process that we walk all of our customers through. Look at the footprint, look at the workloads, 
map dependencies, recommend an op optimization path, right? What's that strategy? Prepare an environment, put a test in place with a workload. Everybody gives it a thumbs up, create a regression path, move to production, and then we're off to the races as far as setting a maintenance and security routine. It doesn't have to be that complicated. Since we kind of ran out of time here, right at the top of the hour, what we'd like you to do um, is any questions that you have, please submit them to our, um, our coordinator, Joanne, um, and she will get those questions to David and I and the team. And we'll make sure we get responses back to you via email. That's our promise since we kind of ran out of time. So with that, um, Thank you very much, uh, David, for participating with us today. Thank you. Um, I'm sure that we're going to get some good questions as we usually do. And uh, anybody wants to reach out, our contact information um, is, is right here. You can go ahead and reach out to us at Connect at Arctic IT. Any questions for either one of us, we'll make sure that we get answered for you. So with that, we'll say thank you very much. And uh, everybody have a good uh, holiday weekend. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.